The use of clinical decision support, or CDS technologies, are a means to improve both the quality and safety of health care. Yet, many people don't exactly know what these systems are. Let's see how some of the experts who have been involved in the development and use of these systems think about clinical decision support. I think when people hear the term clinical decision support, they mostly think about the kinds of alerts and reminders that you see in electronic health record systems tied to order entry or result reporting. They're kind of pop-up reminders, um, alerts, that sort, of, that sort of thing. Well, I define it fairly broadly. I define it as including alerts and reminders, including order sets, templates to help physicians better organize their, their clinical work. I also include what are called info buttons, where clinicians can get uh, information right when they need it during clinical care. Many clinicians only think it's alerts and reminders, and they often tend to be negative about that, actually. Do you remember the, the little paper clip guy, Clippy, that used to pop up when you're typing, when you're using your word processor? What does everybody do with it? They turn them off. They don't want to deal with them. Many Many clinicians, unfortunately, think that's all there is to clinical decision support. Alerts, reminders, things that pop up, bother them, tell them things they already know or they don't need to know, and that it disrupts their workflow. But it's really much broader than that, and even the alerts and reminders, if they're done right, can be very effective. For me, clinical decision support is about bringing appropriate resources to bear at the right moment that are customized uh, to answer questions about the specific patient. So not just a link to PubMed, but uh, a link to a search in PubMed that brings up information about the best treatment for that particular patient. Clinical decision support has the potential to improve quality and safety in many different ways. Many studies have looked at how clinical decision support at the point of the clinical encounter and at the time of clinical decision making can influence the physician to do more of the right thing and less of the wrong thing. There's a lot of ways in which clinical decision making is impacted through clinical decision support. One way to think about it is that uh, there are ways in which our technology can be used to remind us of things. So for example, if you've managed to note that a patient has a history of smoking, it might be useful to have decision support that says something like, don't forget to refer the patient to our smoking cessation program. The patient safety issues often are what people think of with the alerts to prevent a bad outcome. But some of the quality issues have to do with getting required tests done, required screenings. Those are more reminders than alerts. And actually, decision support doesn't have to be computerized, although it helps. A few years ago, working on a study where we used big green stickers, and we put them on the face of charts to remind the physicians to have the patients get flu shots during flu season. That is very much just clinical decision support, not automated. Even though clinical decision support has been shown to improve care, there are also challenges. So the first challenge here is to take the vast literature of, of, of medicine that's growing by leaps and bounds every day and distill that down into the core rules and alerts and info buttons and order sets that make sense for modern American medicine and to then encode them into electronic medical record systems and possibly even for patients in personal health record systems encode the the knowledge in a way that it makes it actionable so that when a physician is is using an EMR in practice an alert might pop up it's a useful reminder or an alert to do something and it's easy to do the right thing that's what I mean by by actionable. Some of the reasons why clinicians dismiss alerts immediately are that they often are not sensitive enough. They're not geared to the particular patient. They are often very generic and sometimes they can't be made any more specific but sometimes I think we probably haven't done the work to make them more specific. I'll give you an example. An alert would be dangerous in, let's, let's say a medication is dangerous in the elderly very often the alert will fire. The physician will be told, this medication is dangerous in the elderly. If the system could take into account the age of the patient and not even present that information except if the patient were, say, over 60, 65, 
then that would be more specific. But a lot of times they just have the information that says this is dangerous in the elderly. And so it'll come up and the physician would say, but my patient's not elderly. <laughs> dismiss. There's another reason why clinicians often dismiss the alerts. Sometimes they don't feel that they need them. So they may feel that they know what they're doing and they may be right and many of the times when people have examined the reasons why alerts are overridden, they're actually very justifiable, but they're probably not always right. I think that different clinicians obviously have different experience with clinical decision support because of the kinds of decisions they make and the settings they're in when they make them. So physicians who are doing order entry are going to have a very different experience than, um, say, um, a nurse who's picking up the orders or an LPN who's uh, reading the chart to uh, understand what to do about the patient. Um, so if, um, depending on the workflow that they have, the decision support may be integrated into that in a way that they're not even really aware of, that they're simply seeing, for instance, uh, an order with an annotation about how to do something appropriately or a link to a help button or something like that. And they may not even perceive it as active decision support. Overriding and dismissing alerts is called alert fatigue and is a major challenge in the design and use of clinical decision support but there are ways to address alert fatigue. It could be as simple as changing a font color, putting a comment on the screen, but not interrupting workflow at all. And in some situations when there are equally efficacious alternatives, you might want to simply show the person, you could also do this, or you could also think about this, but not change their workflow. Versus what we call a hard stop, which is something that you're doing that we are quite confident could lead to a patient safety problem, and in those cases, decision support would often pop up a dialog box that requires you to press a button, acknowledge that you've seen it, sometimes explicitly override the alert. Trying to work things into the workflow is still a challenge, uh, but you can do it by, for instance, having additional information on the screen so that when somebody is ordering something, you could show other information that you think is going to be helpful for making a decision like uh, the price of a drug when you're about to order it or uh, alternative therapies that they may want to consider, um, that sort of thing. Another would be to figure out when an alert's appropriate for somebody at a certain level uh, of, say, of education or experience. So the alert alerts you give to medical students or interns should be different than the alerts you give to attendings. The fact is that there can be different settings for alerts. There may be a drug, for example, an ACE inhibitor that the patient is allergic to. So you choose an alternative drug in a different class, but because of the makeup of those two drugs, the alert still fires. So the, that's always going to be a, a challenge. There are always going to be patients who maybe they couldn't take one statin drug, but they can take another statin drug because they didn't have an allergy, but they just had a side effect or an adverse reaction, muscle pain or fatigue. That alert's always going to fire because it's the same class. So. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's complex and certainly medications and formularies and allergies are complex. I do think high level providers that have clinical understanding need to be addressing those alerts. There may be some systems that have some settings where those alerts can be adjusted, but when we're talking about patient safety, there's no doubt any of us who have been in the system long enough have probably been saved once or twice by an alert that did come up when we still had to you know, not bypass, but put in the, the documentation that, no, I know that this is okay, we'll keep going. One of the problems with disseminating even the best knowledge artifacts from Harvard or Mayo or Cleveland Clinic or wherever is the idea of getting them into those rural EMRs and underserved areas. So part of the issue for crit critically underserved and critical access areas is to make this knowledge available via the cloud, as I mentioned in this idea of the cloud-based clinical decision support. Then, all they have to do is subscribe to a web service in the cloud, if you will, whether it's from the AHRQ or the NLM or private industry, they can have the latest and greatest knowledge kept up to date to the instant, uh, practically, um, in their EMR at the point of care. Clinical decision support is not only alerts and reminders. There are other types of clinical decision support such as info buttons that can provide an educational function. Dr. James Semino was one of the early developers of info buttons, and in fact, he coined the term. Let's hear what Dr. Semino has to say about them. 
So an info button is a context-aware link between one system and another, and typically it's manifested as a link in an electronic health record system sitting next to a uh, piece of information. So a little blue circle with a white letter I in it, for instance, a very familiar icon, sitting next to, say, the name of a drug or the name of a lab test or a result of a lab test or a diagnosis in a problem list. And when you click on that, it uh, pulls up some kind of customized patient relevant and user relevant information. Currently, info buttons are often uh, implemented using something called an info button manager, which actually uses the context information, the patient information, the user information to pull up a set of questions that are based on that context. And then the questions themselves are customized links out to information resources. So for example, if you're looking at a lab test, that measures some substance in the body, you may have a question that is about how to, what does this lab test mean, what are the results, how is it performed. But if the lab test is a drug level, then the questions that a person may have are going to be very different. They're not, they don't care about what does it mean that this level's high. We know what causes that, you're taking the drug. What, what you want to know is how do I treat an overdose or what's the appropriate you know, dosing information, that sort of thing. So those questions can be selected dynamically by an info button manager and then the questions themselves are generated dynamically uh, to provide links that are very specific, specific to the situation. As healthcare changes, clinical decision support will be very important in future initiatives. Some of these initiatives are part of the Affordable Care Act, and others, like the Precision Medicine Initiative at NIH, are developed from new scientific discoveries. When we think about moving from volume-based care to value-based care, the idea that the old world of fee-for-service medicine where doing more earned more uh, regardless or whether or not it actually helped the patient on occasion to the world where we are really focusing on the, on the value of services rendered. What this means is that the coin is turned around the other way 180 degrees. Instead of trying to do more, we have to do what's right and less of what's wrong to really achieve the notion of this value-based care. One of the things that was sort of the first on the scene that we all are aware about that impacts clinical decision support and personalized or precision medicine is genomics. And what we mean by that is each of us has a set of DNA in our body that controls all the ways in which our body functions. The way genomics can impact clinical decision support or impact therapy is if I know you have a particular gene variant, for example, you metabolize Coumadin rapidly, when I'm prescribing Coumadin for you, if I know that, I can adjust the dose appropriately and you'll have a much safer use of that blood thinner. I think the future of, the cl of clinical decision support is going to be tied very closely to the future of electronic health records. And electronic health records that we have today are sort of electronic diaries. Uh, they, they really, uh, you know, they took the paper record and they said now we're going to do it as a computer system and we have these diaries that keep track of what's going on with the patient. So decision support will be much more sophisticated. It'll say, oh, you think that this symptom is caused by this condition, so here's the best treatment for that condition. And by the way, here's how we monitor that. So I'll set up a bunch of orders over time to monitor and I'll let you know when things are going south and then I'll also give you the best evidence for the second line therapy for this problem or other diseases to consider. Another dimension of clinical decision support which I think is going to be of increasing interest is the idea of providing decision support directly to our patients. After all, patients now are equipped with smartphones and smartwatches and computers at home and tablets and, and whatnot and many of them are, are online in, in millions to access healthcare information to help them understand their own health and wellness. Also, patients are gathering vast amounts of data in their mobile platforms in the quantified self movement. So you can keep track of your steps, your heartbeat, your food consumption, your mood, your allergies, where you are and, and what you might be exposed to, and it's just extraordinary. I believe that the future of decision support really exploits that continuum of care. Uh, it, it gets at areas like what is it that I need as a patient in my home for the more than 5,000 decisions I make every day that I don't typically go to a healthcare provider to assist me? What are the types of things that my healthcare provider might want to tell me? It may be that, you know, in the future, that when you get to your car, one of the first things that happens is there are health alerts. Would you like to see them? 
It may be that when you turn on the radio or the television, we are able to broadcast these things. It is certainly the case that when you use your phone, we could be providing you with notifications when you first bring up your phone as soon as there's some piece of information that's sort of breaking news about your health. In summary, clinical decision support tools in the form of alerts, reminders, and info buttons have been used to improve the quality and safety of healthcare. Alert fatigue, fitting into the clinician workflow, and keeping the CDS up to date are major challenges in the use of clinical decision support. Providing CDS outside large academic centers can be challenging, but a promising approach is to provide the CDS services to individual hospitals via cloud computing approaches. CDS will be an important part of the healthcare landscape as part of precision medicine activities and for quality improvement, and to increase efficiencies or decrease costs in value-based care. CDS focused on patients will also grow as patients become more engaged and empowered to take responsibility for their health. Putting the patient in the center is what healthcare is really about, and the use of clinical decision support systems can play a major role in realizing these goals.